Now let's take a look at Linux because not every target is going to be Windows based. There will be plenty of Linux and quite frankly other operating systems, but these are the big ones of course. So let's talk about your Linux system vulnerabilities and exploits. Um, there's such a thing as a Linux distribution. That's simply the version. There have been in history like 300 distributions. Um, a distribution is just like the make and model. So you'll have Red Hat and Kali and Debian and um, OpenSUSE uh, and uh, you'll have all of these variations, right? And Ubuntu. So these are, they're called distributions. They all have the core kernel uh, as their sort of same thing. Um, so the core, the kernel of the operating system is what they all have in common. Uh, so Linux distributions are versions of the open source Linux operating system. Uh, open source means it's free and open to the community. It's not um, proprietary. You can't copyright it. Uh, you can copyright some of the things that you write to support it, but not the kernel. Um, it's packaged with other components like installation programs, management tools, and other software. Linux, being an operating system, has the same categories of vulnerabilities as in Windows. Denial of service, uh, information disclosure. Now, information disclosure happens because of buffer or heap overflows, privilege escalation, remote code execution, memory corruption. Um, another, two other uh, end results of information disclosure are security feature bypass and directory traversal, meaning going into other folders when you're not supposed to. Quite honestly, information disclosure, security feature bypass, directory traversal, these are um, effects of the other things. And they actually also affect Windows and all other operating systems as well. Here are some frequently exploited Linux features. We're not trying to teach you Linux per se. I mean, there are whole classes just on learning Linux, but here are just some of the commonly exploited Linux features. Um, you know, Linux, like Windows, is written in the C programming language or some variant of the C programming language. And um, they, these programming languages have something called libraries. A library is just, some pre-written code that you can reuse again and again and again. And this code does stuff, what we call functions. There's a function in the C library called return to libc. Um, this actually has capabilities that can be hijacked for malicious purpose. So it, um, what it does is the attacker, if they inject malicious code, they don't also have to inject their own shell. And a shell is just an interactive prompt in order to take control of a target, they can just use this function. <laughs> Thank you for creating that for me. Um, another one is insecure sudo, uh, super user do. Uh, it's, it's like the Windows run as command. Um, so you're logged in as just a normal user and you say sudo something and now you're running it in admin privilege, although in Linux we call the admin root. Um, in certain conditions, this is a vulnerability that, uh, and it's not an inherent vulnerability, it's more like people don't use this properly. Um, it allows attackers to bypass protections and execute commands as the super user, as the root, without providing the password. Where you normally would have to provide the password for the, the root user, you can do it without, and that results in privilege escalation. And we can see here that there are various exploits which you don't need to memorize, but just to show you. Most of these you can find on exploitdb.com um, or in Metasploit or in other places, GitHub and other places. Another one is something called sticky bits. Uh, these are permissions that are set on directories. And um, the sticky bits say only the user, only, or rather only the owner who created this directory could delete or rename files inside the directory, meaning the folder. It's really useful in places like the temp directory where a bunch of people uh, share the temp directory. Uh, the only problem is, is that, um, and, and that's supposed to keep everyone minding their own business in a shared folder, but if they're set incorrectly, they could be disruptive and cause denial of service. 
there's something called the set UID um, uh, variables. Uh, so this is, um, you can run a command as if you were another user, which means you don't have to log out and log in as that person. Again, it's very much like run as. Um, but run as, and it doesn't have to be administrator, it's run as typically as a Joe Blow user. Uh, administrators do it all the time to change someone's password. They just uh, use that to, um, without logging out. Uh, it allows an application to run something as the owner, and to do that, you set this uh, SUID permission bit on that application, that file, or whatever it is. Um, so many executables use this, but the problem is, is that they're not coded properly, and we could abuse that and run something improperly as, say, an administrator and escalate privilege. There's another one called the dirty cow bug, which is funny because cow, in this case, stands for copy on write. Uh, this is a race condition in a block of code, um, and it takes advantage of the incorrect handling of a feature in the Linux kernel called copy on write uh, that is part of memory. Uh, what that means is that you can write to other people's memory addresses, even if they are read only. So now uh, let's talk about what a race condition is. A race condition is um, a time of check, time of use uh, gap, uh, where we've checked and authorized a process to run. I mean, the, the system has. But there's a delay time in which that process actually runs. And in that short delay time, um, malicious code can race in there and sneak in and cut in front of the normal code. That's a race condition. And it is a common um, problem when uh, we have applications that, you know, they have to be authorized and they run, there's a delay time, something sneaks in there. So uh, this is um, one of the bugs here. There's something called the five-year bug. It's another race condition. And it is um, something that uh, is, oh, it's created by, um, well, basically it allows privilege escalation. And uh, there is another thing called the remote root flaw. And uh, this is, um, we're not double checking a checksum on something, basically a UDP handler uh, that can, and it gives a user remote uh, control over a system using UDP traffic. And you can read up about, about all of these things if you wish to. So where can we find system exploits? Metasploit has loads of them. They call them modules. Go to packetstormsecurity.com. Go to exploit-db.com. Look on GitHub or, my favorite, Ask Uncle Google. Here's an example of Metasploit. Go to PacketStorm Security. They've got loads of stuff you can download, including for Windows. Um, and uh, they are packetstormsecurity.com as well as a few, a couple of other top-level domain extensions. And you just search. They've got news, and you go to files, and you search, and there's that'll come up with all sorts of stuff. They're run by gray hats, and everything's digitally signed. You can see the little signature right down here, right here. And we'll talk about signatures in greater detail later. Uh, so you can be pretty confident that anything you download from these guys is not going to also be infected to infect you. So those are common Linux and a little bit of Microsoft and other operating system vulnerabilities and exploits.